Hi, this is Rick Warren, and you're watching Facets Television. I'm Mark Babbitt, CEO and founder of U-Turn, and you're watching Facets Television. Welcome back to Ed in Dana Point, California. You are watching Facets Television. I am Kevin McDonald, and with us is Dr. Wen Dombrowski. She's an MD, MBA. She's the Chief Convergence Officer at Catalyze, a geriatric physician executive with extensive experience in bioethics and technology, and she's one of our speakers here at the conference today. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Thank you for having me. If, if the clinicians and technologists and other people working in the field are very intentional about, you know, creating and designing machines and algorithms that are as bias-free as possible, then you can actually create machines that have less bias than humans and, and lead to um, outcomes, uh, outcomes, decisions, and uh, recommendations that would be, in a sense, more objective than our natural human biases. So that's interesting, because one of the other uh, interviews that I did, the, the reference to the fact that the black community in particular gets less care, less prescriptions of the same treatments or remediations that other folks don't. So you're saying that by removing or being very cognizant of removing those biases in the beginning, they may actually get better care? That, that's definitely possible, yes. Okay. Well, that's interesting. So um, so what, what do you think are the greatest opportunities in AI in the next five years? Where do you think we're going to make our best gains? What do you mean by that? Well, the technology itself has an opportunity to improve medicine. So where do you think those improvements will be most focused? So there's a lot of potential benefits for AI if it's developed well. So some of that includes helping to diagnose diseases earlier, especially diseases that are traditionally very hard to diagnose just based on human minds. Um, you know, in this conference and previously, I've met a lot of um, patients and family members who've had clusters of symptoms that are just elusive. They're just mis medical mysteries and no one knows why they're feeling sick and why they're getting worse. But I do believe that as we, you know, process larger volumes of data, that it is possible to identify an earlier both diagnosis as well as treatment for these patients. And you think that the more data, because we're going to be able to pool data from multiple places with outcomes that we know, is that going to lead us to that solution potentially? Is that where you're... Well, it depends on where the data is coming from. So one of the things I talked about in my presentation today is that if we only limit ourselves to the, to the limited data sets that are currently available, such as electronic medical records and uh, insurance company claims, that those data sets are actually a very, very limited subset of the whole truth that of the whole truth of medicine and the whole truth of health. And so we may not be able to find the answers we're looking for if we only stick to these traditional data sets. And I'm a big advocate of including social data, um, environmental data, wearable data, and um, other other public and non-public sources of data. So I was just about to go there with the IoT. So what you're saying is mm -hmm. that, that in, in addition to what we say, what people know about us, and then the devices that we use, that you think that that would actually improve clinical outcomes? I think that, I think that, uh, that it's possible to include clinical outcomes if it's designed well, if, okay. if the data models and the care models surrounding the data models are designed well. So I don't think technology per se is going to fix and cure everything, but if the technology is designed well to be used as a tool, that, then that's, that's what's going to be helpful. So just as an example, you know, if you ask me, are hammers useful or not, you know, the question becomes, you know, are they useful for building things? Or are they useful for tearing down things? Or, um, you know, it depends who's using the hammer. Is it someone who's a skilled carpenter? Or is it someone who's clumsy? So it's not whether or not... It could actually be the, a negative. Right? It, it could be, yeah. Right, and because yeah. there's hammer has two different sides and you can use it to demolish things mm -hmm. or you could use it to build things up. So I think any technology, including artificial intelligence, has the potential to really make significant gains in our health and our society's well-being and it, it can also have that potential to be destructive or or have very little impact if it's not designed well. Interesting. So um, give me a little bit of, of the speci uh, specificity on what Catalyze does. What do you do as a Yeah, company? sure. So Catalyze, we are both a corporate innovation consulting group as well as a virtual startup accelerator. So my business partner and I and our and our network of experts, what we do is we help healthcare organizations such as hospital chains, insurance companies, and pharma medical device companies with innovation. Mm -hmm. And that can include both high level understanding of, you know, 
how can these organizations really transform from their their legacy cultures into a more innovative cult culture and be you know leaders in their markets on in terms of adopting technology and we also help these organizations with sourcing and developing specific technologies to help their pain points whether it's to help their patients their clinicians their operational processes their financial processes and in addition to helping the healthcare organizations, we also work with technology companies, okay. which could either be um, long-standing technology companies that want to go deeper into healthcare or aging care, or it could be brand new companies like startups that are, you know, trying to that have a great idea but trying to figure out how do they actually, you know, develop a business and get connected to the different stakeholders such as the, the healthcare corporations and to investors and, and um, other stakeholders. So when you say um, accelerator, are you speaking in terms of an incubator classic where you come in and help that new company kind of design its process and potentially raise money or whatever that might be? Yeah, so we are a virtue incubator in that sense. So we don't have a physical space where people have to come in for a nine-month boot camp. But what we do is we help the startup companies at whatever stage that they're that they are at with with their specific needs, anywhere from ideation to product design, product development, um, helping them navigate FDA approval, uh, HIPAA compliance, okay. and uh, helping them understand what is the the healthcare and consumer market space and what is the best go to go to market and customer acquisition strategy. Because at the end of the day, it's for us, what our, one of our core principles for Catalyze is not so much just, you know, what is the business model and revenue generation, but how do we try to enable other stakeholders in the ecosystem to really generate social good, social impact mm. through the use of technologies and new business models. So speaking of HIPAA, this will be my last question. And, um, you mentioned the ethics issue, and, and then, of course, we've been discussing throughout the last couple of days how it has a bit of a tendency to interfere on some levels. So mm -hmm. while we ethically want to keep things private, what we're doing is stopping. One actual um, interviewee stated that he believes that the United States will not be the leaders in AI and medicine because of HIPAA. What do you, what's your opinion on that subject? So I do think that HIPAA and it, HIPAA, the rule I think is being misinterpreted by a lot of healthcare organizations because part of the P in HIPAA is portability. Yes. And right now, most healthcare organizations, so they're risk averse and they're actually interpreting it as unportable data. Isolate, silo. Exactly, yes. siloed data. And so what we're seeing emerge in you know in the past few years and the upcoming years is that there is a group of what I would call patients, family members, caregivers that are that are really from a consumer perspective, from a citizen perspective, demanding for better access to their own data, better sharing of their data, and also better, but better sharing of their data amongst their own family, but also sharing of it with perhaps other families who may have kids with a similar disease or you know other doctors for a second right. opinion. So right. I do think that, I'm not sure if the rule is gonna change on a policy level, but I think we're gonna to start to see more and more creative ways of handling consent for data sharing and getting around that that concept that somehow mm -hmm. and in fact it wasn't just part of it the portability was what HIPAA was supposed to right. be all about well on that note I really want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us thank, thank you so you. much and I hope you enjoyed the conference yeah look forward to seeing what you're doing in the future thank you thank, thank you for you. having me thank you very much I'm Kevin McDonald we are here at AI Med in Dana Point California and we're out we're back at the AI Med Conference, and with me is Dr. Steve Wortman. Dr. Wortman is an MD, PhD, and an MACP. He's got his AB from Cornell, his MD and PhD from Johns Hopkins, and he's one of our speakers here. He's also the president of the Association of Academic Health Centers. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Pleasure to be with you. Um, so you're one of the speakers. This is the first symposium of its type. Let's talk a little bit about first what do you think of the event and what do you think the intent of this event is? Well, my view is one of excitement and enthusiasm. And the reason I say that, Kevin, is that getting the tech companies and the tech sector to work closely with the Academic Health Science Center is very important to me. And I see this as a first step toward major engagement in doing that. Mm -hmm. So there was some conversation yesterday about um, that there seems to be some people that perceive AI as a competition with doctors. I actually see it as an incredible enhancement and, a, and an, uh, an ability to produce more ideas and to increase your ability to do your job. How do you see uh, artificial intelligence? Well, I see it as necessary to the practice of medicine and increasingly so in the future. 
as knowledge moves more and more out of physicians' brains, which only have limited capacity to process the mega data sets for patients that are out there, we will have to work with artificial intelligence in all our medical decision making. I think the key challenge is how to do that best and how to do it in the interests of the patients so that care can be delivered compassionately. So what can the tech industry do best to, to remove the governor and take the limitations off of what you doctors would like to do with AI? I think first and foremost, the tech industry needs to demystify itself to the physicians and the academic community, mm -hmm. most of whom have not been trained in artificial intelligence, computer science, things of that sort. It's very hard for them to cross that line that says, yes, I'm comfortable with it. So I think the tech industry has to become more transparent and more clear about what it is they're doing, how they're doing it, and why it is not a threat, but a tremendous opportunity. I would agree that it is an immense opportunity. I, and the more I think about the the releasing of information that's been trapped in paper records, and even in EHR records, right for doctors to be able to combine their own brains, right? And then use AI to, to pull that information out. Um, what do you think the biggest challenges are against AI at this point? Well, I think first of all, doctors have had a hard time in general with the electronic health record. Um, it's a platform that many will say have inhibited the doctor-patient relationship because it's taken time away from face-to-face -face contact with patients mm -hmm. and more with the computer. Yeah. To the extent that artificial intelligence can remove that barrier and restore the intimacy of the doctor-patient relationship, I think we'll have a good result. Well, that's fantastic. So um, what was your presentation about? I talked about what I think academic health centers need to do in this coming year of artificial intelligence. How they need, first of all, to optimally align their education, research, and patient care programs so that each teach each other to be better in real time mm -hmm. and thereby create a true learning health system. So as a technical person myself, I come from the technology industry. Right. So. Um, what can I do to best align in the way that you ask? I mean, how could I approach the medical community in a better way? I would say the seamless transmission of information between the spheres of research, patient care, and education are necessary to create platforms that work seamlessly together so that each improves the other in real time is the tech ta challenge in my view. Mm -hmm. So from the privacy perspective, there are some healthcare privacy regulations and I know that there's challenges especially with DNA sequencing, for right. example. How do you uh, anonymize a DNA sequence? You really can't, right? I think there are enormous ethical and moral challenges coming, not just in medicine, but in so many other fields with this revolution that's taking place and this transformation. I don't have the answers to it. I think reasonable people need to sit down and figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had in place, for example, HIPAA, which you're probably familiar with, mm -hmm. uh, for many, many years, and we've learned to work with that as best as we can. We've seen its flaws and we've seen its positives. Mm -hmm. I think the same approach is needed for this, but it's a little more complicated and I think a lot harder to come to a conclusion. So if you were king for a day and you could get anything you want to enable what you envision, what would that be? For healthcare? Yes. I would like to see um, artificially intelligent healthcare platforms that can be um, easily um, taken advantage of by patients anywhere in the world mm -hmm. at minimal cost with uh, superb uptake with the latest information, data, and treatment. That's what I would try to do. I would try to make healthcare uh, something that is available to everyone in a meaningful way. So the one last question, um, what do you think the biggest challenge is in getting the correlation of healthcare and AI in a proper way beyond the technology? Is it a, is it a social issue? Is it a, an education issue? What do you think yeah, that well, it's is? It's all of the above. It's a cultural issue. Okay. It's a cultural issue. You know, uh, organizations like medicine, institutions like medicine, academic centers, things of this sort, um, are conservative institutions. Mm -hmm. And those who work at these places are highly independent experts in what yeah. they do and getting them to change the way they do things is very, very difficult. Hi, I'm Dr. William Feaster. I'm the Chief Medical Information Officer at Chalk Children's Hospital in Orange, California, and you are watching Facets TV. So with us today is Dr. Randall Wetzel. Dr. Wetzel is the Chairman of Anesthesiology and Critical Care Medicine at Children's Hospital of LA. He's also a tenured professor of anesthesiology and pediatrics at the Keck School of Medicine, USC 
And he is here to talk to us today about what he has been presenting here at AI Med in Dana Point, California. Thank you so much for coming in today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So, um, I saw a piece of a stage presentation yesterday. You seem to have a lot of energy, and you seem to be excited about what you're doing here. So, why don't you give the audience a little bit of a sense of what you think is so exciting about artificial intelligence? Um, it is uh, it's the promise. Um, and beginning to see the promise that has been around for artificial intelligence for many years, but now that promise is becoming reality. Suddenly, uh, we've gotten to the stage where what we believed could happen is now technologically possible. And that's very exciting, to actually have data in, in such large quantities about our patients and be able to analyze it very quickly um, and see that it tells us things about our patients and patient populations we didn't previously know. It's like uh, being in a candy store. Every day, I go, wow. It's, it's either confirmation, seeing that the science and the math comes up with the same answers that we believe, that's exciting, but that it sometimes comes up with answers we haven't been able to come up with ourselves, and probably even more excitingly, with different answers than what we believe, because that can really lead to further questioning and further knowledge discovery. And even changing the questions we know and we need to ask. There's just too much. I mean, I don't, I don't have enough time. So let's get to that to, to that point about it being too much. Um, how do we take the super big data and turn it into knowledge versus just having a lot of data? Well, that is what this conference is all about, <laughs> um, and how we do that. I mean, this was not possible ten years ago. This was not possible five years ago. Data management, data storage, data computation, the advantage of the faster GPUs we now have for managing data is all been in the last few years. So even though we've been able to plan this out, um, we haven't actually been able to see the results. Um, we suspect it will work, now we're finding out it will work. Uh, and how we get to all that data, um, data, certainly we, everybody knows massive amounts of data is available from everything in the universe, basically, and mm -hmm. certainly that's true about our patients. Um, that's that's a problem for humans to deal with. I can't comprehend more than maybe six or seven data streams at one time. And I work in an ICU where I have 25 patients who are producing 100 data streams apiece. Right. And Not it's integrated. It's incomprehensible yeah. that I can manage critically ill children f and attend to all of that data. Um, so we are beginning, that, that needs pre-filtered, um, that needs some thought about it, uh, that needs presented to me and others in a way that we can rapidly comprehend it. So as, in, as an innovator, do you, do you think it's as good or better than you imagined it 10 years ago? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, definitely better. Um, what surprises me is how long it takes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess that's really the general field of AI. As, as you may have heard at this conference, we know AI's been through a sort of boom and bust phase over the last 50 years. Um, and the reason it failed in its first two iterations were the lack of hardware and the lack of large amounts of digital data. It didn't really have the substrate to, to operate on. Mm -hmm. um, and we're finding out that theories um, that were untestable um, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, actually are true now, because we can now actually test them because we have the hardware and the data to do it. So and we have people in the subject matter areas, healthcare, medicine, who are embracing these technologies and who are um, looking for their validity. So how do we deal with the issue that the, the medical device manufacturers tend to be um, closed pocket on sharing information about how their devices work, what outputs, the APIs, the things that we're used to in the technology business mm -hmm. now, APIs are natural. It's mm -hmm. like, if you don't provide an API, I don't want to use your device. But in medicine, that doesn't seem to be the case. What do you think it's going to take to help them get you to where you need to go? <laughs> uh, that is certainly a major problem. Um, uh, we prefer to that as vendor lock. The data is in the vendor's equipment, and they don't want to share it. Mm -hmm. They know it has value. They're not extracting the value out of it as much as I would like to see them do it. Mm -hmm. um, and they're getting a little more open. 
um, about sharing. Uh, I think we can only keep at them. Um, we have to find ways to access that data, whether it's in our contracts with those vendors, um, although they promise everything, uh, they deliver as little as they can. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it is uh, always a conflict, uh, especially when you're used to being in a university world where you believe knowledge should be open, shareable, and data should be free. Right. Um, I'm going to start a campaign to free the data. Um, free the I feel data. all those poor enslaved data bits and bytes are, are trapped inside of other people's machines. We need well, to and free the results the are certainly trapped, for sure, for all of us, right? So yep. I can see from that perspective. How do you see the, uh, the regulatory construct for privacy? Does that get in your way? I think that it was necessary. Um, I think that we would be in much worse shape had we not had someone impose some boundaries on what you can do with other people's data. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, this is an unusual thing for me to think, but I think government intervention at the time <laughs> to protect the, the transportation and sharing of data, or put some rules there, saved us from what might have been a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. um, if we had started, as our tendency might have been, sharing everybody's PHI all around the world, um, that probably would have led to a very serious tight clamp down on things. Right. Uh, and we wouldn't be able to do anything. So now else. it's like ratchet down, now let's loosen it up to the degree that we need I to, to be able I, to do the things that we need to do. I think that if you, I think that the data, the consumer's data, the patient's data in their hands, they're willing to share for purposes either for their own health or even for altruistic purposes mm -hmm. if they're given participation in that. Now, I do data research on you know, tens and tens of thousands of patients, all of its de-identified data, I couldn't identify those patients. Well, <laughs> I'm sure somebody thinks they could, um, but I don't, I'm not interested in doing that. Yeah. Um, and um, so far the view of that has been, as long as the PHI is stripped out um, and the data has been anonymized, that it's not human data and we can do research on that. That's a reasonable compromise. Yeah, um, I would agree with that. So, and, so we're on that point. Um, where do you think we're going to be in five years from your perspective? <laughs> so what I would like to see, and I guess where I'm driving in the, in the virtual PICU, um, is to, in my, my happy world, all of that digital data that's being produced in the ICUs and streaming off our monitors and into our EHRs is compared to all of our previous experience um, that we have in digitized data, analyzed by algorithms, um, mm -hmm. work through workflows so that I can look at a patient in the ICU, spend time with the family, and while I'm meeting them, talking them, and doing, you know, first sort of things, the artificial intelligence is working on the data streaming from that patient and learning from all of the experience we've had before. It's really the model that is healthcare for 2,500 years since Hippocrates. Right. Pay attention to Just your patients, the power the capture data. the data, um, and learn from the data. Yeah. Um, and we haven't had the power to be able to learn from the data as fast and as much in depth. Um, we rely on clinicians at the bedside to have a data bank, not just what they read, but their practice, their right. experience, the actual treating of hundreds, if not thousands of patients. Well. If we think that's important, we can do better than that. I could give the actual experience of 10,000 patients to every doctor at the bedside. Um, and as an enhancement, not a displacement. As an, I think that's no. the most important thing. No, I, uh, I, I think physicians have been around, or health providers have been around throughout all of human history. Um, uh, societies have thought that they must provide some benefit because generally they're well rewarded for their tasks, even though it's probably not until the last maybe 50 or 60 years that they actually helped more people than they harmed. Yeah. Um, what did they provide before um, the powerful tools we have to actually cure some diseases now? Why were physicians or health providers or priests or the local shaman, what did they have to offer? Yeah. Um, that, and that was that their, kept them around. their history and their intuition and their tied in human Correct. Human they could go, right? you know, that, that expression, if he gets through the night, yeah. he'll be fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Prognosis. But, and, you know, if in the 1600s you had a pain and you went to the doctor and he said, you better write your will, that was valuable information. I can't help you. <laughs> I can make you feel a little better. Here, take some poppy. Um, but uh, that's important information. Um, and... It's interesting because it is very close to what AI does well, predictive modeling.
Um, well. So I think that having those tools and the ability to convey that information and having the time to sit down and do that with families, um, I'm looking forward to. I'm looking to a cognitive prosthesis for mm -hmm. all of us so I don't have to spend my time in the library reading. I could actually sit down and talk to the family. Well, with that said, I really want to thank you. I very much enjoyed Pleasure. this conversation and uh, I look forward to seeing what you do uh, for the community and for, the in for, your, for your community and for all of us. You've been watching Facets Television. I'm Kevin McDonald and with us today has been Dr. Wetzel and we are at AI Med in Dana Point, California. Right.